So Encanto is actually a really cleverly disguised psychology lesson about what's called the seven inner child archetypes. And you can read about this in Cornell psychologist Dr. Per, uh, LaPera's uh, book, How to Do the Work, where she talked about this. It's the caretaker, the overachiever, the underachiever, the rescuer, life of the party, the yes person, and the hero worshiper. So for example, in the yes person, we see the same exact description in the profile fit the person of Camilo. Now, Camilo is a, uh, his power is ability to turn into really anyone or, or anything, it seems, seems like. And yet, as a shapeshifter, he chooses almost entirely to replicate the person he's talking to or the person he is next to. And this is what we call the yes person archetype because it's somebody who tries to mirror the opinions and the behaviors of somebody they're talking to so as to become more likable. And it's a self-defensive mechanism. And it's particularly interesting because another word that we use to describe this type of work is a person who's a chameleon. And that's not a coincidence that his name, or seems like a coincidence, that his name is Camilo. And we also see that the other seven major characters who have superpowers also fit the seven archetypes. The seven inner child archetypes are all represented by the children in the movie Encanto. And opposite the overachiever or the perfectionist Isabella is actually a really interesting character that I find a lot of people don't talk much about, which is Dolores. We have here a perfect example of kind of a yin and yang. We have a person who is always being seen, right? Isabella is always being seen. She is a flower maker. She is obsessed with being pretty because she has to be pretty. And it's not just for her, it's for other people. And then on the other side is Dolores. Dolores is somebody who only listens. And, and that's very important because throughout the whole movie, she serves only one purpose to the family. She is the family, in some ways, secret, secret keeper, right? Or a therapist. And she was amazing at listening. She hears everyone. She knows everyone's secrets, but nobody ever sees or acknowledges her. Which is why throughout the movie, we see these little moments where she is, one, constantly feeling very, very tense, right? You see those little moments where she makes these little like, mm, mm, moments? Because whenever she hears something that she knows that she has to keep as a secret, she goes into this tenseness, but that's also, in a very sad way, her main source of value. She feels like if she doesn't keep the secrets of other people, she won't ever really have a purpose or be needed. And that's why it's in the end, it was so important that when she finally goes to the, the, the man that she loves, his first words back to her was, I see you. And she says, I hear you. And why that's such an important thing, because what that actually sim symbolizes is mutual, genuine communication, where each side is not just speaking to each other for the sake of being heard, they actually acknowledge each other. And that's the foundation of a really good relationship. One of the most discussed characters in the movie Encanto, of course, is Louisa. And uh, we see her and her song is very clear, right? She's the one who's going through burnout. She's the one who's always been the strong one. And I love that she is a female character doing this. But if you actually dive deeper into her character, she reveals something that I would say psychology books talks about, you know, one of the seven archetypes of inner child woundings. When we hear the term, oh, like self-care, we oftentimes think that it's just about taking a break. But in that song that she is singing about the fact that she feels like, who am I if I'm not the one who is, you know, literally at that stage in her film, she's literally carrying the, the weight of the earth on her shoulders. And she asks that question, who would I be if I wasn't carrying everybody else's burdens? And that's the key. We make the mistake of thinking that, oh, like taking care of ourselves is just taking breaks, but it really isn't. It's the fact that, a lot of us who are feeling that kind of pressure of having to bear everyone else's burdens, we get into a pattern where we can't stop doing it. And we actually start, when we, when we run out of things to do, we actually start going around looking for problems to solve, looking for burdens to carry, because that's the only way we feel like we're worthy. My own teacher at the time uh, said to me, look, when you feel like you're needed, you don't have to worry about being wanted. What Bruno really represents is mental health illness. In his song, you know, we don't talk about Bruno, which I love, by the way. He tells people that like, oh, like he's gonna get a gut because he keeps, the person keeps eating too much, or that someone's fish is gonna die, or that someone's gonna go bold. These are just unlikable, but simple truths that we all experience. When we actually eventually meet him, he is a mess, an absolute mess. He demonstrates 
obsessive compulsive behavior, you know, when he goes in and he starts knocking on the walls in a very specific pattern at a very specific time, he has these almost delusional relationships with the rats representative of possibly schizophrenia. And this is a big problem because in a lot of these kind of families, we don't talk about mental health. We don't talk about Bruno. We don't talk about the struggles we go through, the sense of depression, the isolation, the feeling of disconnection. We don't talk about these things and we pretend it doesn't exist. And why it is that Bruno's main symbolism is that of falling sand because it represents the one thing, right? And that means that what it demonstrates is if this family does not start fixing their problem and start talking about Bruno, which is these mental health struggles, they're all kind of going to end up like him. He represents what they're going to be like, the ultimate prophecy all these people are going to go through, struggles, if they don't start talking about it. If you start with Isabella, for example, Isabella for perfectly fits the overachiever profile or the perfectionist profile. She is constantly feeling like she has to pretend to be someone who she's not and specifically around the words of perfection because everyone around her kind of emphasizes that. So, you know, when she is seen as perfect, she feels at ease and comfortable. Not when she is actually performing or doing anything significant. This is why when she is going through that most important scene where she is having that revelation and she creates this cactus, the cactus becomes a very symbolic symbol because it's the first time she's ever created something for herself. And it comes from a parental perspective where there's usually three key problems that parents have that, 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 that result in kids feeling like they have to constantly be performing perfection, not being perfect, but actually performing perfection or looking perfect to other people. And the first thing is that they're not allowed true emotional expression. And we see this again in Encanto, right? When, when Elma is walking by Isabella, she kind of stands up a little bit straighter and looks a little bit nervous. It's very common in a lot of different cultures as well is the fact that there is a pressure to perform like they're doing well even when they're not. No human being can be perfect. Perfection is not an actually acquirable goal. It's just a general idea. Even though Encanto's a kid's movie, it's actually a movie that's designed for parents, especially emotionally immature parents. When I say emotionally mature parents, it's referencing a book called Adult Children of Emotionally Mature Parents, and it's brilliant. And of course, Alma represents this. See, Alma comes from a different generation, and it's very common that I see this in immigrant families in particular, because they come from a generation where they saw conflict, war, famine, or something major that was very traumatizing for them. And so therefore, in their upbringing, they take these lessons and their traumas, and they project it onto other people, and then they inflict it upon their children. But I thought there was one deep Details particularly interesting, which is when at one point, you know, Mirabelle had just told everyone she, she sees the crack and she's like, we got our dresses, we gotta save this thing. And we see a moment where Elma says, This is all your fault, the cracks are all your fault, everything is, is your fault. And she says, you know, Isabella, you know, becoming a mess, Louisa becoming weak is your fault. But most interestingly, she says, Bruno disappearing is your fault. Now, the first two, understandable. It's some, in some ways, it's true. Now, Bruno had nothing to do with Mirabelle. And I think that was one of Disney's way of hinting at you that, as a matter of fact, she's full on in projection mode. So her transformation actually comes from a place of self-forgiveness and letting go of control. Because that's the thing a lot of parents don't realize is that the more they try to control the family, the more the family actually begins to crack. And that especially when the kids start growing up and becomes adults, they have to go through a process called individuation and a separation from the family, establish your own true identity, and then rejoin the family. And because she never let them truly grow up and she was always trying to control them, they never got that chance and the house was almost broken by her actions. And in Canto, the seventh and most important archetype character really is, of course, Maribel. Maribel is the miracle of the family. She is otherwise known in the archetypes as being the hero worshiper. When we first intro are introduced to her, her big song is the family matter gal. And what we see is she's kind of worshiping her family and puts them on a pedestal. She literally talks about how everyone's a hero, everyone's amazing. She talks about every single member of the family and how great they all are. And she doesn't talk about herself. She's always in the darkness. She literally, in the family photo that first takes place after Antonio's big reveal, is in the shadow. And she says, I'm fine, I'm fine, 
I'm not fine. And that change is so important because she doesn't feel fine, but she's so used to saying to everyone else, I'm fine, I'm fine. The hero worshiper archetype is somebody who puts other people on a pedestal and believes that they can do no wrong. I mean, how many of us go through our lives feeling like in our family, in our environment, and we go, well, they've done so much, they've accomplished so much, they've got it all together, why don't I? How often do we feel that sense of not good enough, not strong enough, not capable enough, and not beautiful enough, like Louisa or Isabella? And then coming back to realize that as a matter of fact, our gift, like Mirabelle's gift, is bringing people together, is connecting with people. And there's something within ourselves that's actually much more beautiful, much more powerful, if only we come to acknowledge ourselves the same way we do others.